you don't know how much I've wanted to get back up here on this stage, on this mark. So this is a great emotional shot in the arm for me, and thank you for not throwing eggs at me this morning. I haven't, I've already told this to the traditional crowd who's coming in back here. Um, I haven't preached in seven Sundays. If you don't do anything for seven weeks, you get a little bit rusty. So you can expect me to be rusty this morning. Keep your eggs in your pocket. Don't be throwing your eggs. I want to thank Josh Schubert. Man, what a great job Josh is doing. Wait, yeah, way to go, Josh. He's one of our own, but my goodness, how he has matured. So glad, so glad to have him here. I want to thank the deacons for feeding Linda and me uh, all through the month of September. And some others, or deacons and some others, did a great job. I told the traditional group uh, on the last Sunday in September, as we had received our last meal uh, from the deacons, Linda said, aren't the deacons supposed to feed us through October? <laughs> no, no. September's, September's the last day. September's the last day. Uh, thank you all for praying for me. Thank you for every card you've sent. We have a stack of cards at home, six feet high. Uh, people at the hospital said, you must be pastor of a great church. And I said, oh, you just don't know. You need to come visit. You need to come visit First Baptist Church, uh, Flugerville. What a great, great church it is. And you all are great. And I thank you for being so great. Now, with all the thank yous done, am I, am I forgetting anybody? Let's get down to business. We're here to honor God. We're here to put Jesus on the throne. Take your Bibles or your smart devices and open them with me this morning to the book of Joshua. Sixth book in the Bible. Joshua. I want to begin morning by just asking a simple question. What defines our relationships? What defines our relationships? Kind of creep into this. For example, what defines our relationship with our co-workers? I would hope respect defines our relationship with co-workers. And I know not always the case. I know sometimes spite, you know, impatience perhaps, uh, tolerance. But most of the time, the word respect would define our relationship with our co-workers. If we don't have respect for each other, it makes the work environment very, very difficult, even, uh, even uh, now as we're doing our work remote. What about neighbors? What word would define our relationship? We all have relationships with our neighbors. What word would define our relationship with neighbors? I would hope it would be the word friendship or friendly. I mean, they're not best friends, but we do live next door to them. We do live in the close vicinity. We see them when we're outside. We see them when we're mowing the yard. Uh, we have a friendly relationship with them, and we, as we should. What about our family? What word defines our relationship with our family? I think we'd all agree the word love defends our, I mean, uh, uh, defines our relationship with family. Oh, we get mad at each other and we argue with each other and we have our falling outs with family, but still we love each other. Love defines our relationship with family. Now, how do we define our relationship with God. Faith. Those of us who follow the Lord, we have a faith relationship with God. Faith defines our relationship with God. What does that look like? What does a faith relationship with God look like? What can we expect from God in a faith relationship with Him? What are our priorities in our faith relationship with God? Well, the third chapter of Joshua um, gives us some healthy, basic building blocks, some helpful hints that I want to spend time with this morning. Joshua 
chapter 3, beginning in verse 9. Now you know the context here. We're looking at the crossing of the Jordan River. There's a lot that's happened before, and of course a lot that's going to happen afterwards. Let's begin here in chapter 3, verse 9. Then Joshua told the Israelites, Come closer. Listen to the words of the Lord of the Word your God. He, Joshua, said, You will know that the living God is among you, and that he will certainly dispossess before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites, when the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth goes ahead of you into the Jordan. Now, choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. This is still Joshua speaking. When the feet of the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, come to rest in the Jordan's waters, its waters will be cut off. The water flowing downstream will stand in a mass. When the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, and this would have taken a lot of preparation. We'll talk about this more in just a moment. When the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carried the Ark of the Covenant ahead of the people. Now the Jordan overflows its banks throughout the harvest season. But as soon as the priests carrying the Ark reached the Jordan, their feet touched the water at its edge. And the water flowing downstream coming at them. Water flowing downstream stood up in a mass. I've lost my place. Uh, stood up in mass that extended as far as Adam, a city next to Zarethan. The water flowing downstream into the Sea of Arabeth, the Dead Sea, was completely cut off and the people crossed opposite Jericho. The priests carrying the Ark of the Lord of the Covenant stood firmly on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan while all Israel crossed on dry ground until the entire nation had finished crossing the Jordan. Now Hebrews 13.8 says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change, and he hasn't changed, which means, listen to me, which means... We can tell a lot about the way God is today by simply analyzing this event. As we analyze this event and we see God uh, interacting with his people, we can tell a lot about the way God's going to interact with us today in our faith relationship with him. Now let's notice a few things. First of all, God provides supply in keeping with our need. What was Israel's need? Well, they needed to get on the other side of that river, didn't they? That was their need. Pretty big need, by the way. Their faith relationship with God, in their faith relationship with God, these folks had faith that God was going to meet that need. They had faith that somehow God was going to get them across the Jordan. Now the thing we're taking note of here this morning is that God provides supply to meet a specific need. He did with them and he will with us. This reality had been ingrained into the heart and soul of the people of Israel. When I read that passage a moment ago, and as you read along with me, and as you still can look back and notice, there was no indication of hesitancy from the people. There was no bickering. There was no backtalking like we saw with Moses. There was no, this is a fine mess you've gotten us into. You know, like we saw uh, with Israel toward Moses. These people had a faith relationship with God at this point. At this point in their lives, they had a faith relationship with God. Because of their faith relationship with God, they expected Him to meet this specific need. They witnessed God do this several times before. They witnessed God meet their specific needs before. 
or they heard their parents talk about it. So they expected it again as they faced this river. They had witnessed God inflict ten plagues on Egypt in order to get Pharaoh to release them from captivity, or their parents had, and parents had told them about it. They'd witnessed the Exodus itself, which was a mammoth ordeal. They'd witnessed the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of flames by night God used to protect them in Egypt before they crossed the, the sea. They'd witnessed the parting of the Red Sea. They'd experienced God's protection during 40 years in the wilderness. They were still experiencing, by the way, they were still experiencing the provision of manna every morning when they woke up on the ground, enough manna to feed them throughout the day. They'd grown up, if you think about this. They had grown up eating manna every day from God. God always provided specific supply for their specific needs. And they understood he would provide a supply to get them across this Jordan to the other side. They didn't know how, but they expected him to do it. What's the need you're facing in your life? I need to make this transition. You're pretty much familiar with everything we've talked about so far. What's the need you have in your life? And you say, how does Pastor know I've got a need? Come on. We've all, we've all got a big need we're facing. In your relationship with our Father, do you expect Him to supply that need? You see, that's the nature of a faith relationship. We, we expect it of God. Do you know what happens when a person does not have this expectation of God to supply their need? Worry happens. Worry happens. When we have this faith relationship with God and we don't expect God to meet our specific need with a specific supply, worry happens. That's not part of a faith relationship. When we worry that God will not supply our need, we're not in a faith relationship. For the last month, Linda has driven me everywhere we've gone. And I've had to sit in the back seat on the passenger side like a wimpy little boy. <laughs> and by the way, you talk about a tough nurse. She has, she has no sympathy at all for my plight. I learned to do what she said and to do it with a yes ma'am. So if I wanted to get out, I'd ride in the back seat on the passenger side where we were going and then I would sit there. She wouldn't dare let me go. By, this is the biggest crowd I've been around since my heart surgery. She wouldn't dare let me go in. So I'd sit out there and wait and play games on my phone and listen to Fibber McGee and Molly on the radio classics. So I'm sitting in the car in HEB and another car pulls up in front of me and a young couple is getting out of the car. This young couple has a baby. So they're getting out and they're putting on their masks and the dad puts the baby in, in uh, it probably has a name, they're carrying uh, that papoose thing, you know. That, and so he puts the baby in that uh, carrying pouch on his chest as they're getting ready to go. And I recognize this baby has a problem. This baby has a need. This baby needs baby food. It's a specific kind of food. Can't buy ribs. <laughs> this baby needs diapers, and there are several different sizes of diapers. This baby has some specific needs that have to be met inside HEB. And now here's the problem Do these people understand his or her need enough to get the right stuff? 
Do they? I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Do, do these parents understand that baby's needs well enough to get the right stuff while they're in H-E-B? Let me tell you how worried this baby was. <laughs> Dad had to reach down and pick the baby's head up because that baby had a genuine, bona fide, person-to-person faith relationship with his parents. That's what it looks like. Specific supply, specific need. You have a need in your life. It's a specific need in your life. If you're in a faith relationship with God, if you have, if you have given your life to Christ Jesus, if you've turned away from the world, turned to Christ, cried out to Him, ask for forgiveness, and follow Him in a faith relationship, in a faith relationship with God. God meets specific needs with specific supply. Do you know that? That's why we're looking at this passage. They had a pretty specific need. Pretty specific need. Here's another thing I'm going to call your attention to. God provides supply in proportion to our need. Israel had a big need. Now, you've got to admit this. This is a big need. They had to get across that river. And there weren't just a few of them either. According to the census taken in Numbers chapter 26, there were now over 600 able-bodied men. These were men who were able to serve as soldiers. There were 600 able-bodied men. If each man had just three family members, which is conservative because they had big families, if each man had just three family members, there would have been over two million men, women, children, elderly, handicapped, not to mention livestock. How much livestock do you suppose two million people have? That's the crowd that needs to get to the other side of this river. That's a big need. That's, that's all I'm wanting to say to you. That's a really big need these people had. And yet God supplied their big need, didn't he? He did it in an unorthodox way. He did it in a way, I think it's fair to say, they probably weren't expecting but they had a faith relationship with God. And because they had a faith relationship with God, God met their really big need. It's important to point this out because we both know you're facing a big need. You're facing a big need. It's coming at you. But regardless of how big your need is, your need is not as big as their need. It's not that big. Your need's not as big as their need was, for crying out loud. Can you confess that? Can you admit that? you got a big need, but you're not trying to get two million people across a river at flood stage. Your need's not as big as their need. If God supplied their need, God can supply your need. He may do it in an unexpected way. He may do it in a way that is not your way. He may do it in an unorthodox way. I know what that's like. But in a faith relationship with God, God provides supply in proportion to need. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has confirmed that at 1,645 feet, Lake Tahoe is the eighth deepest lake in the world. The lake is so deep that if it were tipped over, its contents would cover California in 14.5 inches of water, which would be good right now, wouldn't it? If they could tip it over, it would be a good idea for them to do that. 
Tahoe could provide every person in the United States with 50 gallons of water per day for five years. The evaporation alone from Tahoe over the course of one year could supply a city the size of Los Angeles with water for five years. Just the evaporation. And Lake Tahoe is a small lake compared to Lake Superior, which is 120 times larger than Lake Tahoe. <laughs> Good grief. The world's largest lake, the Caspian Sea, is 576 times larger than Lake Tahoe. You talk about some water. No matter how big your need for water, you couldn't drink all that. Do you agree? If, if you had a need for water, if you had a need to consume water, if you had a need for a lot of water in your lifetime, in your lifetime, you could never, ever, ever consume that much water. The supply is just way greater than your need. Agreed? No matter how big your supply, your need for supply in life, no matter the nature of your need, you could never personally exist the limits of God. You just can't do it. His supply is way greater than your need. Compared to His supply, your need is microscopic. It's barely noticeable, your great need, compared to God's great need supply. So when we have a need, no matter how big, we should become accustomed to asking big. God's got it. And we should become accustomed to expecting big. You know why? Because the largeness of the need is irrelevant to God. It doesn't matter if our need is mammoth. It doesn't matter if our need is complex before explanation. Our mammoth need before God is irrelevant. It means nothing to Him. Small is big and big is small. Our mammoth need is microscopic before God. He doesn't see the difference in our lives between big needs and small needs. It matters not to God. Ask big and expect big. All that matters to God is our faith relationship with Him and our expectations of Him. Like Israel, we need to have big expectations. These folks were in a faith relationship with God and their expectations of Him were limitless. God will provide supply for you in proportion to your need. Small need, medium need, large need, doesn't matter. Do you hear me? Does not matter how complex your need is. God provides supply in proportion to need, even if that is getting two million people to the other side of a muddy, rushing river. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm going to look at one other thing, and I really... I've saved this till last because this recently has been the most meaningful to me. God provides supply at the time of our need. At the time of our need. We can tell from our passage that there was a great deal of talk about what God was going to do. A great deal of talk among the people of Israel about how He was going to stop the flow of the Jordan River and walk the people across it. That's God's promise. And I just want to tell you, let me interject myself into this. If I were part of that crowd, whether I was a leader or 
or just one of the men, I know myself well enough to know what I would have done. I would have snuck away from the crowd. Hey, Lynn, I'll be back in a few minutes. I'm going to sneak away. Let me. I would have snuck away from the crowd, and I would, have, I would have walked over there to the Jordan River. I would have. I would have stood there at the Jordan River and reminded myself, this river has been flowing since the beginning of time. Every day, every night, summer, winter, spring, fall, every season, every year, forever and ever and ever from the beginning of time, this river has never, ever stopped flowing. How's God, God's going to stop it? I mean, I'm, I'm in a faith relationship with God, but are you kidding me? And it's harvest season. Look at the river for crying out loud. It's out of its banks. It, it's rapid. It's loud. It's wide. How are we going to get folks across this river? How, how's God going to stop this? I mean, I've got a faith relationship with God, but I would have been analyzing that river, and I would have been wondering, how is God going to do that? Do you know the problem with that kind of reasoning? I'm trying to analyze tomorrow's need with today's supply. All I have today is today's supply. It's futile. It's futile to analyze tomorrow's need with today's supply. We can't do that. We can't do that. You know, I'd, I'd, have stood there, I'd have stood there thinking, yeah, I've heard the stories from my parents and from the last generation. I've heard the stories about how God did all of this, you know, part of the Red Sea and the plagues and the pillar of fire. I've heard all that, but that was then. This is now. This is me. That's how we do when we face Tomorrow's need with today's supply. When the time came to cross the river, the supply would be there. The peace would be there. The understanding would be there. It would all be there when the time came. You may have a great need coming up in your life. And you know God has promised certain things. You know, the problem with trying to do that, the problem with analyzing that need in your life and trying to figure it out and worrying is because you're trying to analyze tomorrow's need with today's supply. You don't have God's supply yet. Why? Because the need has not arrived yet. Are you following me? That's a great need you have in your life. And it's coming. It is. It's going to be here. But it's not here yet. You can't analyze that need with today's supply. You're going to have to wait because God supplies, provides supply and proportion to need at that time. At that time. When the time comes to meet your need, the supply will be there. Hard to imagine, Yes. We can't know what God's supply is going to be. I'll tell you this. He may not do it in a way that makes sense to you. You may think he's late. You know, God, the need is here. I'm sure they were thinking that as they were approaching the river. Don't you think? Here the priests have got the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders, and they're walking toward the river. Any time now, God. Any time now, God. Any time now, God. You know, you're going to be late, God. It, nothing happened until they stepped in the water. The need arrived. My feet are wet up to my ankles. Now it's time. And God provided the need. Look at verse 15 and 16. Now the Jordan overflows its banks throughout the harvest season. Obviously this is the harvest season we're looking at. 
and set up its banks. But as soon as the priest carrying the ark reached the Jordan, you see, now it's time. Now The time's come. Now it's time. Their feet touched the water at its edge, and the water flowing downstream stood still. Only when the time came. Only when the time came. Linda and I have had a dose of this truth again recently. Five years ago, I received a new aortic valve in my heart. You know, that's a once in a lifetime event. You only have one heart surgery, right? If you ever have a heart surgery, you just want it once, right? So that happened five years ago. Well, the heart valve was corrupt. It started spewing out bacteria, blood clots going all over my body. Still have some in my legs we're going to deal with a little bit later on. So we're a cardiologist, and he's kind of explaining this to, you, to us. And uh, so... How do we solve this problem with a corrupt valve? And he said, well, we've, we've got to go in and take it out. We've got to put in a, a second valve. Man, that's, that's tough news. So we went home and we wept a little bit. And then we remembered when we get there, God's going to supply. He's going to provide the supply. We're not there yet. We're analyzing that second valve surgery with today's supply. We're not going to receive that supply until that need arrives. And sure enough, our testimony to you is that on August 27th, when the time came for that second surgery, when, when that need arrived, God provided the supply. We had a peace, we had a calm, we had a strength. Let me, by the way, just as, as a footnote. So we went through that, and we had the second surgery behind us. Praise God. Thank you. You're so great. You, you got us through that need. We're just so grateful to you. And then uh, I started becoming anemic. I was losing blood. A lot of blood. You have 15 units of blood in your body. I had less than seven units in my body, so... I was losing lots of blood. Now, we're sitting in our den, and we're thinking, okay, I just had a new heart valve put in, and I'm losing blood. What would you have thought? Where's the first place you would have thought, where am I losing blood? That valve is leaking. So after a few moments of anxiety, again, we gathered ourselves and said, that need has not yet arrived. We're trying to analyze future need with today's supply. When that need arrives, the supply will be there. And I really thought I was facing a third surgery. But it wasn't my heart valve. God said, no, we're not going to let that happen. Here's, our testimony to you is this. Now listen up. God provides need. He provides supply to meet needs. He provides supply in proportion to needs. That was August 27th. I'm standing before you this morning preaching, for crying out loud. I'm preaching. And God provides supply at the time of the need. If you have a faith relationship with God. Do, do you have, you at home, do you have a faith relationship with God? Those of you sitting there on your couch, in your robe, drinking coffee, do you have a faith relationship with God? Turning away from the old life, the old ways, 
the old thinking, turning to Christ Jesus, crying out to him, Lord Jesus, please forgive me, I've sinned. As best I know how, I'm going to follow you for the rest of my life. When we do that, we enter into a faith relationship with God. Do all of you here have that? You, you can't have it before you leave. Before you leave, you come down here and talk to one of the pastors in just a moment. You can enter into a faith relationship with God. Those of you there at home watching on live stream, if you don't have a faith relationship with God and you want all the things we've talked about here this morning, you can enter into a faith relationship with God this morning by simply turning to Christ Jesus, crying out to Him, begging for forgiveness, following Him the rest of your life. Because listen, folks, when we have a faith relationship with God, we're in store for some mighty big supply. We're in store for some shocking supply. We're in store for God doing some pretty unorthodox things in our lives. We're in store for God doing some things in our lives that we really, in our mind, our logic, our imagination, we can't even imagine, but God intervenes in our lives and does some great, great things. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What we've looked at here this morning is exactly the way he is today. His supply is enormous. Your need is small. Turn to him today and let him do a great work in your life. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, it just gives us indescribable comfort, peace, joy to know that you have never changed and that you never will change, that what you've showed us of yourself in Scripture is still the way you are today. We have needs, all of us have needs today. Not as big as, not as, big as these folks need we're looking at in our Scripture. We turn to you. We know that you're going to provide supply to meet those needs in our lives when we get there. Quiet our hearts, calm our hearts as we're attempting to imagine how you're going to solve those needs using today's supply. You're going to meet those needs according to tomorrow's supply, which we cannot imagine. Lord, lay it upon our hearts today how great and how good you are. Lay it upon our hearts today because some here in this room, in this moment, some watching on live stream have not yet entered into a faith relationship with you. Help them to do that today. Help them make this the first day of the rest of their lives. Do a great work among us as we turn to you with eyes of great expectation. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen.